Amen. Well, this morning, if you weren't here this morning, which I know a few people here are just here for tonight, I would love it if you went and watched my sermon on YouTube uh, because it sets the foundation for tonight. And I, we started a new series that I'm starting the first half, and then Ben's going to finish it in a couple of weeks, uh, the second half of it. Uh, and it's simply entitled The Purpose of Our Church. And so I was really praying as a favored church. We've been going for just over seven years now. Obviously, here in Brisbane, uh, we took over the leadership of this church nearly a couple of years ago. And so I was really praying with God about, okay, stepping into a new season in our church. What does it look like? And I think that sometimes in church, it can become so complicated with so many different things happening. And that it's a good thing because we want to provide things for people where they feel like they can learn about Jesus, get closer to God, get closer in community. Uh, but I really felt challenged by the Lord to simplify the purposes of our church. And the reason why I wanted to do that was is because uh, I feel like... Uh, the direction our church is heading in, it's like a compass, right? And the Lord gives direction in church through his word and straight revelation. Now, when the Lord gives direction through his word, it's what we as a church and every other church in the world should be doing. There are clear black and white things in the scriptures that every church should do, every church should live by, every church should prioritize. But then there's other revelation as well that comes from God that may not be as black and white. And in different churches, it may look differently. Every church has its own flavor. And thank God there are different flavors of church. I love cookies and cream ice cream. I think it's the best ice cream that ever existed. But sometimes I want cookie dough, right? Like sometimes I want, like I don't, you know, and, and not everyone likes cookies and cream. Does everyone like cookies and cream? Who here doesn't? Who here doesn't like cookies and cream, all right? We've got a couple heathens here. We're going to pray for you at the end. Graham, stop it, right? Like, thank God, then, that we have other ice cream so Graham can enjoy... Poison, boysenberry. All right, fair enough. Well, there's a different ice cream for everybody, right? And, and I love that about church is that we don't just have one style of church. Our church is not better than the church down the road. We're just a different flavor. And I want to make sure that as a church, we're heading in the right direction. And sometimes we can get one or two degrees off. And I want to knock us back in a little bit. Just make sure we're in the right direction, heading in the right way to God. And so uh, I put down the few purposes in our church. Uh, can we put them on the screen? This is it. And it's in order. This is what I think are kind of the five, five main purposes in our church. And the last one's how we do it. So this morning, I preached on worshiping God. And so when we talk about the purpose of our church to worship God, the purpose of our purpose of our church service, even here tonight, the main foundational purpose tonight is not your needs being met. Yeah, right. And I preached on it this morning, you can go back and listen, but it's not your me. The foundational purpose is that we as believers in Jesus come together with the body, with the fellow brethren, as we used to say it, and we lift up the name of Jesus together. We worship Jesus and we hear a God glorifying message from the word that ultimately glorifies him and help us live as Christians. That is the main foundational purpose. And as we do that, there's a flow on effect that happens that we get filled up by God. We encounter his love, his goodness. We see healings, miracles, signs and wonders, experience the supernatural presence of God. Those are all great, but the foundational purpose has to be to worship God. Tonight, I'm going to talk about point number two, and then we've got pastorally caring for those within our community. And then help the poor and needy outside of our community. And Pastor Ben's going to be preaching on that. And there's a reason why it's in that order. Because biblically, we should care for people within our community before we care for those outside. And if you're like, oh, really? But Jesus said go and feed the poor and the needy. Yes, he did. But Pastor Ben's going to beautifully explain to you why biblically. And so that's going to be good. And then... Uh, we believe that God's bringing our church into a season of training and blessing pastors and churches outside of our community. Uh, with our conference, just to give you a heads up on it, it's the first year we've opened it up. We've only done it for two years. Two years? Two years? Yeah, we've only had two conferences. We're still a very new church. 
And, and so this is our third year, but we're opening it up to other churches because we've had a bunch of other people ask if they can come. And so we're doing this special thing called a, a pastor's experience for senior pastors. Uh, just because we've had a bunch kind of ask, hey, how do you do church? Why does it seem to be working and all that kind of stuff? So we've opened it up. We've already had 120 senior pastors and then extra because some of their spouses are, are, are already signed up for this pastor's experience. So now we just need to work out what we're doing, but they've signed up. <laughs> For this, and we're gonna we're gonna bless them. We're gonna give them insight into our church. Have some special session, sessions with our guest preachers. I'm speaking a bit weird tonight, aren't I? I'm not I'm not getting my words right. And uh, so I believe that we're really stepping into that as a church. In June, uh, we're doing a pastors conference in a little place called Bahol, which is in uh, the south of the Philippines, uh, where they have chocolate hills and mountains, and they have animals that look like Pastor Ben. All the Filipinos laugh because you know exactly what I'm saying. There's these little animals called a tarsu. What's it called? A tar, tarsier that have the biggest eyes in the world, right? And it looks like Pastor Ben. And uh, and so in June we're taking our Bible college students down and we're doing a a pastors conference for 300 pastors in the region. And we're going to be doing a lot more of that. So I believe that's on our church. But tonight I want to talk second part of this series about how to make, train, and release disciples into ministry. If we can get the right foundation first of worshiping God, that it's not about a me-centered church, it's not about just meeting my needs, but it's to worship God, then the next logical thing that we can see in Scripture is after we worship God, we must take that worship, we must take whatever interaction we have with God, and we must go out and make Disciples. Jesus tells us, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, therefore, go. Isn't that interesting? He says, go. Don't just stay in church and try and make disciples, but go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is an instruction that has not been given to just pastors or just leaders, but to every single person that calls himself a believer of Jesus. You have a mandate to go and make disciples. It's not just for a select few, it's for everybody. And the discipleship process is a two-step process. The first part of the process is actually becoming a disciple, right? That's the first. And a disciple means you follow Jesus. And so becoming a follower of Jesus is a process where we get to a point where we understand who we are and who he is. The Bible's clear that we have all been born with sin. Sin separates us from God. God exists, but we can't have a relationship with God while we are separated by our sin. And our sin is all the things that we think that we do that's outside of how God would want us to live. And there needs to be a price that is paid for this sin. So that's what Jesus Jesus did. Maybe you've heard the story of Easter. We get a vacation at Easter time, right? Easter bunny chocolate. Well, there's a reason. Yeah. It's because Jesus, who is God, Emmanuel, which means God with us, prophesied in Isaiah 53, which Amy just read out before, hundreds of years before it would happen, Jesus would come to this earth, live a sinless, perfect life, allow himself to be arrested, falsely accused, go get beaten and bruised, put up on that cross, nails through his hands and through his feet, and he died. And when he did that, he took your sin, my sin upon himself. But when he rose three days later, he broke the power of sin. And when you get to a point where you believe everything I just said, and you accept the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, and you understand there's nothing you can do to earn it other than humbly coming before God. Oh, you're a disciple. That is the gospel message. That is step one, becoming a disciple. But the second part of the process is walking the discipleship journey. A disciple is someone who believes and follows Jesus. And so discipleship is an ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus until the day you meet him face to face. That's what discipleship is. So once we become a disciple, 
what do we do? What do we do in our church? What do we do with discipleship in our church? I, I, uh, I get asked two questions a lot by different pastors, particularly in the Philippines where, where we live. And, and they come and they go, you know, how, how have you done this? Favorite church, how have you done this? And my answer simply is God has been very kind and we have worked very hard. That's, that's simply it. God is kind and we work hard. A lot of people want God to be kind and be lazy at the same time. God will bless your hard work, right? So God has been kind. We've worked very hard. The second question they ask is this. They always go, uh, so what do you do for discipleship? In fact, about a month and a half ago or two months ago now, I was meeting with a, um, a representative of the Filipino Statistics Authority. And we've been applying in the Philippines to become our own denomination legally. And uh, we are. Now we are our own denomination. And it means that we can marry people now that we want. We had 26 weddings last year in our church, which is wonderful. But we need more people to be able to marry all these people. And so uh, in order to, to get this sort of legal denomination status, I had to have an interview with this guy that represents this Philippine Statistics Authority. And he's a part-time pastor, and he works for this people. And he had to, he had to come and work out basically that I'm not a cult right? Like he's trying to work out that why is this white guy here in the Philippines? Uh, and so I hid all the white robes and I got all, <laughs> no, we don't have any of those. Uh, we have black robes. And so I, I hid all of them. And basically we had this conversation halfway through. He asked me this exact same question and he goes, what's, uh, you know, what's your discipleship process? And I go, oh, are, like discipleship, what, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, what do you, what do you use for discipleship? I said, oh, you mean what book do we use for discipleship? He goes, yes, yes. I said, oh, the Bible. <laughs> so we, we use the Bible. See, the reason why I was asking is because in a lot of churches in the Philippines and actually around the world, what we've done is we've kind of watered down this, this, this whole thing of discipleship to following a book. And half the time, it's not even the Bible. Yeah. It's another book, yeah. right? And it's, so it's like, well, well, what's your, what do you do for discipleship? And I, and I answered him. I said, well, actually, you know, we, we follow the Bible, but we don't really have a book for discipleship because we believe that if discipleship is becoming more like Jesus, then everything we do in our church should be discipleship. Yeah. Everything we do. If discipleship is looking more like Jesus every single day, becoming more like Jesus, then everything we do in our church should help us become more and look more like Jesus every single day. And yes, we have a book. Yes, we have different things. Who here has ever left Sunday service feeling closer and more like Jesus after you've left a Sunday service? Fantastic. Guess what? You just got discipled in a Sunday service. We disciple people in the Sunday. We have connect groups. Who here loves their connect group? Come on, I love connect groups. In connect groups, we do discipleship in connect groups. We have prayer meetings on a Wednesday morning on Zoom. Come on, get out of bed. You don't even have to get out of bed. It's on Zoom. Open your computer or your phone. Turn it off. We pray every Wednesday morning. What time do we pray? 6.30? 6.30. I don't. That's 4.30 in Manila. I'm not getting up that early. I do my Manila prayer meeting at 7 a.m., but we're there. We pray. We have our presence nights. Come on. How many of y'all love presence? I love every time I'm in a presence night, I walk out feeling closer to Jesus. I just got discipled. When I talk one-on-one -on -one with people, I feel like I grow closer to Jesus. In fact, it really, if you look at the method of how Jesus discipled people, he discipled them one-on-one. -on -one. He discipled them one-on-three. -on -three. He had his boys, Peter, James, John. He discipled one-on-12. He had, you know, the big 12. He had 72 disciples, the Bible said. And then he preached to 20,000 people at a time. Could I tell you, there's not one method of discipleship. And if someone says there is, they're, they're wrong. There's not one method. Anything that you experience or encounter that helps you become closer to Jesus, helps you more like Jesus, that is discipleship. But not just that. We actually do have teaching courses. At the moment, we're in the middle. Are we in the middle? Have we finished? We're in the middle of one of our grow classes, which is called How to Read Your Bible. Because we want to teach people how to read the Word. We've got different grow classes. Build Foundations is our foundations class, which is great for people that are new to the faith. Also great for people that have been in the faith so long they forgot why they believe what they believe. Yeah. 
We're going to have different classes on parenting, on marriage, how to deal with finances, how to have healthy relationships, prophetic master classes, all this kind of stuff. We are going to add things more over the years because as well, we do want to teach you about Jesus. Here is my guarantee. Are you ready for this? This is money back. I promise you money back guarantee. I will give you back your steak knives. Ready? Listen to me. This is my money back guarantee. We will train you and equip you in this church to a level that you will then be able to take personal responsibility for your self-discipleship. I promise you we can do that in this church. We may not be able to take you through a four-year PhD seminary degree. That's not what our church has, and that's not the purpose of our church. But I promise you that we can get you to a place where you can begin to actually take personal responsibility and self-disciple yourself as you follow Jesus. This morning, I talked about our, our, our bratty church kid. For those that were here. So I want to welcome back our bratty church kid. It's the bratty church kid that thinks church exists for me, for meeting my needs. I have a checklist. And once the church doesn't meet my needs, I'm going to go off to another church down the road. And there I'm going to be there until they don't meet my needs. And then I'm going to go to another church. And okay, so welcome back to the bratty church kid. Do, do you know what I found is one of the, the biggest hallmarks of a bratty church kid? It is actually this. They make the responsibility of their growth and their walk with God somebody else's responsibility, not their own. That's one of the greatest hallmarks of a bratty church kid. Is someone that sits there and blames their lack of growth, blames their lack of spiritual depth, blames where they are at in their Christian walk on their pat. Well, the Thurman's not meaty enough. I need more meat. Give me meat. Give me meat. I need more meat, right? And they want more meat. They want more meat, but they don't even know how to love their neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And they blame somebody else instead of taking personal responsibility. A sign of a maturing disciple is one that takes responsibility for their own discipleships, and they move from baby food to adult food. Interesting, this analogy, baby food, adult food, it's used a couple times in the Bible. Let, let's look at how Paul uses it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus. Are you not mere human beings? So Paul's saying here that worldliness and selfishness are a sign of spiritual infancy. Yeah. 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 It's amazing to me how people can be in church their whole lives and still be drinking milk. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. But it doesn't always start off that day. So it doesn't always start off that way. Uh, I've had three children. Um, I haven't had them personally myself. My wife has given birth to three children, and I helped. Uh, I had the easy part, and, and I helped. And my wife's father is here tonight, uh, and he knows what it's like. He helped produce my wife. And so my wife, uh, she's, she's had three kids. Our first kid we had in, in Perth, and so they had all these rules and regulations in Perth, and uh, it was hope. And then we went... Uh, to the Philippines, and we had our second uh, daughter, Sienna. And, you know, if anyone ever tells you that childbirth is beautiful, they are absolutely lying. It is disgusting. It's like a war movie. It is, there is like, like, if you have a natural birth and you're not on drugs, you're screaming, it's yelling. If you're on drugs, the husband's still feeling nervous. If you have a cesarean, like I said, so Kate's had three cesareans. So in, in Perth, there was like this big sheet. I wasn't allowed to go behind it. But in the Philippines, it was awesome. I walk in the room and I see Kate's entire guts are out on her stomach. The doctor is burning through the skin. I've got my phone. I pull out. I start <laughs> filming. The nurse is like, sir, sir, you cannot film, sir, you cannot. And I said, oh, okay, okay. 
I literally have Sienna's birth on my phone. She's, you can smell the skin burning. It's wild. They pull the baby out. It's there. I cut the cord. I feel like a man, even though my wife's the one that's just been cut open. I feel like I created life. Right? It's this wonderful moment. You know what's interesting about having an infant? This is what's really interesting. You never have to teach them to be hungry. I remember the first time I saw Hope begin to look for food. No, 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 listen to me, listen to me. It, it, you don't have to teach a baby to be hungry. They can't even see. You know babies can't even see till eight days old. So when you go hold a newborn, like, oh, they're smiling at me. No, they're not. You are just a blob <laughs> to them. But I saw Hope beginning to look, beginning to look. And then when she latched on and she found the food source, I didn't sit down with Hope and go, okay, look at me, sweetheart. This is what's going to happen. You're going to feel hungry, and this is what I need you to do. <laughs> I need you to look at me, raise your hand, and say, Daddy, come please have some milk, Daddy. Come please have some milk. I don't know why my daughter became British in that moment, but she became, come please have some milk, Papa. Go to the fridge, get some milk for me, Papa. Right? So, so I didn't have to teach my, my baby to do that. I found that when people become Christians, genuine Christians, genuine like, oh, radical encounter with you, I'm now saved. I may not understand everything. I may not be able to see everything, but I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Have you ever been around a new Christian? It's exhilarating. I love it. They're, they just, they, like, I, I get text messages from new Christians sometimes when they just get saved. They're like, James, do you know there's a verse in John that says God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on a cross? That's incredible. Cap capital letters. That's incredible. And I love it because my initial response is, Psh, yeah, everyone knows that. But then I go, oh, yeah, no, that is incredible. You never have to teach a newborn how to feed. They're hungry. But here's the thing. At some point, we have to teach them how to move from milk and actually teach them how to eat solids. And then not just eat solids, but we need to teach them how to begin to feed themselves. Some children don't get taught how to feed themselves for years. In the Philippines, there's a culture, a nanny culture. We call them yayas in the Philippines. Yaya, right? And, and a bunch of people have yayas. And so uh, it's great if you got to go to work. But unfortunately, the yaya nanny culture is actually quite destructive because it allows parents to be lazy and they let other people raise their children for them. And I've seen this time and time again. I, I'm in the mall, and I see people having dinner, and there's 10-year-old children. And, like, legitimate, there's, there's no, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with the child at all. They're not, they don't have any, um, you know, weaknesses there. They're just legitimately 10 years old. And these yayas are feeding these kids at 10 years old because no one ever taught these little kids how to feed themselves. And it's disgusting. Yep. And I want to go over there and tell them, let them eat themselves! <laughs> but I can't because that would be me. But it's interesting because this is how ch church has become to some people is that the only time you eat is on a Sunday. And not just that, I'm the one feeding you. I am your yaya. <laughs> the same me-centered church people, they just continue to drink milk, drink milk, drink milk, drink milk, and they never, ever grow up spiritually because either we don't teach them or they don't want to be taught. Because if I don't get taught, then I don't have to take responsibility and I can just blame everybody else. The writer of Hebrews takes on this similar analogy, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. He says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk. Use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. 
The writer here is saying, you, you should be on solid food, but instead you need to go back and get these elementary truths over and over again because you haven't grown up. But do you know how the people have grown up? Is by constant use having trained themselves up to distinguish good from evil. They'd stop making the same old mistakes. They'd be able to grow up and discern what is right, what is wrong. Why? Because they consistently went to God. Constant use of His Word. Constant use of His Spirit. Constant use of allowing Him to come and shape and to mold us. Let me say this again. If you have a genuine hunger and a desire to feed and to grow in God, we will feed you milk. We will then begin to feed you solid but most importantly we'll teach you how to not only feed yourself but then teach you how to feed others and that's when you step into a new level of discipleship with God you take responsibility for your own discipleship but listen to me this doesn't mean all of a sudden you become a lone ranger I'm a disciple now I'm a disciple of Jesus I don't need church anymore. It's just me and God. I can do this with him. Uh, I think that if you reach a level of maturity in your discipleship, it will actually motivate you to pursue deeper relationships with other people within the body where iron begins to sharpen iron. Don't ever get too high and mighty on becoming a mature disciple. We always talk about balance in our church and what we preach and, and what we teach. We, we want to give a holistic picture of what we preach. And so here I am spending the first part of this message pushing you to maturity in your discipleship, pushing you to take responsibility of your discipleship. But I kind of want to balance it out with this. Don't become arrogant. And don't ever think that you've reached the destination of discipleship. Because you know what the destination of discipleship is? Death. Death with Jesus face to face do you know how you get face to face with Jesus death like you're in heaven that's the end of your discipleship journey thus meaning you never reach the point of I have made it as a disciple no that's why we call it a discipleship process and a discipleship journey because you continue it your whole life until you die we want to grow mature disciples in Jesus but unfortunately I've seen many people turn this almost into idol worship where we begin to worship this idea of mature disciples. And we can focus so much on this idea of making spiritually mature disciples that we can easily become spiritually arrogant and forget that we are on a journey. Do you know what the, do you know what the average discipleship journey looks like? Three steps forward, two steps back. That's what it is. That's what it looks like. Sometimes four steps forward one step back seven steps forward nine steps back come on anyone know what I'm talking about the discipleship journey is not this thing where you just grow you just grow you just grow you just no it's like yes Jesus what the heck Jesus I love you going back like that is actually a real discipleship journey Discipleship is not about how many people we can put through a course or who read a book. It's about people committing to a journey to become more like Jesus. And we can never get arrogant about becoming spiritually mature. A few years ago, right as COVID hit, um, there was a pastor in the Philippines that wrote a Facebook post that was uh, aimed at our church. Uh, without mentioning our church's name. Uh, isn't that lovely? When you get online, you're just scrolling, and you see something, and you're like, oh, good morning to you too. And it was this pastor, and uh, a, a, a couple of people had actually left their church and come to our church, which happens in church all the time. It's not a big deal. Tons of people leave our church and go to other churches. It's just what happens, and so not a big deal. And, and uh, essentially, the post was kind of having to go at some of these people that had left the church to go to this other church, which, you know, hi, it's us. And, and essentially saying that the only reason why they were going was because this church had concert-like worship. 
you know, and just make people feel good, but that's not real discipleship. And in our church, he was saying, in our church, we make real disciples, and we do like that. And I read it, and firstly, I was like, wow, thank you, concert-like worship. That's quite a compliment. <laughs> I didn't think it was that good, but I'll take, <laughs> I'll take it, you know. That's the, I appreciate that. But as I read it, I kind of felt a little bit like, so basically what you're saying is we have good singers but immature Christians. Like we got people that can sing well, but what we, we don't have discipleship. And, and I began to think about it because it's so easy to judge people from the outside, right? It's so easy to judge other churches. Like, I, can I tell you, I love the other churches in our city. Yeah. I really do. I see churches moved 35 seconds away yeah. from our church, right? And, and Pastor Paul Geerling is, is one of the best men I know. In the hardest time of my life, he loved me, he took me under his ring, he cared for me. And, and when he told me he was moving 35 seconds away from us, he was nervous to tell me. And I said, Paul, that's amazing. Welcome. I mean, our location is better, but welcome. <laughs> we got the gateway, but welcome. <laughs> welcome. I love it. I love the different churches. I, I love, and, and, and it's easy to judge another church from the outside. Don't ever fall into that trap. Don't do that. And I began to think about how, could you imagine, could you imagine, let's go back to the original disciple maker, ready? Jesus. Like, let's have a look at Jesus for a second before we get all high and mighty and think we're spiritually mature. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus spends three years not just teaching, but living, talking, breathing, investing, teaching them intellectually, and then showing them physically, and then releasing them with authority to actually go and do everything he's commanded. I mean, this is three years of this, the most incredible, intense Bible school of all. You are walking with God wrapped in flesh. You are seeing the miracles. The Bible talks about how we wouldn't have enough space in all of the books in the world to be able to record the healings and the miracles that Jesus did when he was there. The Bible talks about how all those that came to Jesus got healed. He had crowds of thousands at a time. Can you imagine that? I interpret that as Jesus healed thousands at a time. This is Jesus. So let's look at the impact that Jesus had. One of his disciples stole money. The whole ministry, he was taken a little bit off the side. Then he ends up being disloyal to Jesus, gets bribed for a bag of silver, and puts Jesus to the to the to the captors ahead of him, Judas. Then he goes and he commits suicide. Wow, what a great leader Jesus is. Stick with me. Another guy, Peter, anger issues much. In the moment Jesus getting arrested, he pulls out a sword and he chops up three years. Love your neighbor. <laughs> Be a good Samaritan. Peter, ah, <laughs> chops off an ear, right? Then a few hours later, stands in a courtyard looking at the person that he's just spent three years with and then denies him three times, the last to a little girl. The Bible says Peter cursed at that little girl. Come on, how many of y'all swearers feel good about that in Jesus' name? Come on. Man, Jesus is not looking like a good discipler right now. Could you imagine the Facebook posts we would have posted on Black Saturday? <laughs> then, at his death, there's only one disciple that's actually at the cross, and it's John. And John describes himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved the most. <laughs> so the one guy there has an ego problem. All the other disciples, the Bible tells us, fled. They used the word fled. They fled. Then Thomas, don't even believe he's alive. Could you imagine what that pastor would have written about Jesus? <laughs> Do you know what brought all the disciples back? It was relationship. When Jesus walked up on that beach, and I don't have time to get into it, but they're fishing. The second miraculous catch, Peter sees as Jesus runs. 
Thomas finally comes and finally believes, puts the finger through the holes, and he finally believes. Do you know what drew them all back? It wasn't the intellectual teaching of Jesus. It was actually the relationship with him. They came back, oh, Rabbi, you are here. You are alive. It's relationship. Do you know why God created the church? It's because the church is the greatest way that we can actually be disciples. You want to display the characteristics of Jesus? You want to be kind? Guess where it's tested? With other people. You want to be patient? Guess where it's tested? With other people. You want to be patient? Join the car park team. Tonight, we just started handing out tickets. (laughs) I had a girl walk in, and she goes, I just got a ticket in the car park. Oh, well, that's not my problem, honey. That's uh, slow down. And <laughs> no, they're not real tickets, are they? They're funny. Are they funny? Yeah, we're not really like that. We're not that type of church. <laughs> that's IC does that. And um, <laughs> Pastor Paul's actually preaching at our leaders' events this year, so we love him. I make a joke. So, so uh, church, I mean, you want to test your 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 goodness, your faithfulness, man. This is why Jesus created the church. No, yeah. one of the reasons why. It's because actually in community, in relationship with one another, that's where we actually get the best discipleship. You know, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, I think people don't preach about this enough. I don't even preach about it enough, but I love this so much. It's found in Acts chapter 4. And in the lead up to Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are walking. They walk up to a gate called Beautiful. It was a beautiful gate in Jerusalem. And there was a lame man sitting on the ground. Everyone knew he was lame. Everyone, he had been lame his whole life, disabled. He couldn't walk. And this guy, all of a sudden, he looks up and he's like, do you have some gold? Do you have some gold? And I don't know why every, every person tonight is British. I don't know why. <laughs> I've been watching too much Monty Python, right? So it's British. And Peter looks down and goes, silver and gold I have not. But what I have, I give you rise in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Pulls this guy up. Guy goes nuts. He's going, I actually believe, again, just, I I just, don't just read the Bible, imagine the Bible, right? right? If he, if he had never walked, right, his legs would have been, would have been unable to actually carry his weight. So I believe that when Peter pulled him up, I believe that in that moment, there was a creative miracle that happened that, that muscle actually grew. I can't prove this and, and you can't disprove this. So that's good. (laughs) You know, and I'm, you know, this doesn't affect my salvation, but in order for him to have walked, he would have had to have had enough muscle, which wouldn't have been there. So it's like not just a miracle. I don't think it's just this guy walking. I think his legs would have looked different in that. I just imagine as he's getting up, muscle beginning to grow on his leg. This guy goes nuts. He's running around screaming, going crazy. I've been healed. I've been healed. Everybody knows this guy. He sits at the gate. He begs as they walk through. Every time he begs, same guy. He's begging, he's begging, begging. The religious teachers of law, they start getting real angry. And they see this commotion. It's one of them Jesus followers. And so they arrest Peter and John. They arrest them for, for healing a man. You talk about persecution. What, someone at your work doesn't like you because you believe in the Bible and what it says? You're not getting arrested for healing people. This guy gets they get arrested. They get brought before the teachers of the law. And they go, why did you do this? And Peter stands up. Oh, I love this. You can read it in your own time, Acts chapter 4. Because the first bit, it says this. And then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, began to preach, and he began to preach the gospel. And he basically stands up in front of the religious leaders and go, he, I didn't heal this man, but he was healed by Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth, who you killed, right? This is like an intent. You got to read this, Acts 4. So he says this whole speech. He basically tells the gospel message. is beautiful. And then this is one of, I think, the most powerful verses in the whole Bible in verse 13. This is what it says. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. If you haven't been to Bible college, this should be one of your favorite verses in the whole Bible. Because you don't have to go to Bible college for someone to notice that you have been walking with Jesus. When I die, once, you know, the weeping has ended, after the parade, 
through the streets of the Philippines and Brisbane. <laughs> On my tombstone, I've actually told my wife, who I'll probably die before her because she's way healthier than me. I said, on my tombstone, I actually, I don't want all my accomplishments written on my tombstone, you know? I don't want all my titles, reverend, doctor, you know, incredibly good looking. I don't want any of those. Those are just mere titles. I actually said, on my, on my tombstone, I, I want it written, he walked with Jesus. Like, I really want, I want people to be able to see me and go, there's something, di- who do you walk with? There's something different about you. You want to know what a disciple is? A disciple is someone that walks with Jesus. And the beautiful thing about discipleship in God's kingdom is you don't walk alone. You walk in family. The second purpose of our church is to make, to train, and then release disciples into ministry. A disciple should become a disciple maker not a church attendee our goal is not to make church attendees our goal is to make disciples who in turn become disciple makers I promise you we will feed you milk and we'll teach you how to go from milk to solid then we'll teach you how to feed yourself and then we'll teach you how to begin to feed other people That is the purpose of our church, and to be honest, it should be the purpose of every Christian. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Every one of you. Some of you will do it in this city. Some of you will go around this state. Some of you will go around this nation, and some of you will go to the nations of the earth. Some of you, a very small percentage, will do it from a stage. All of you, the large percentage, will do it from your work cubicle. We'll do it from your social media, talking with people. We'll do it at your family Christmases. We'll do it at the sporting clubs that you're involved in or your children. We'll do it at the school pickups when you sit there and all the moms are sitting there and the dads are waiting for your kids. That is where it will happen. That is where it will happen. Discipleship is best done in community. It's not about knowledge. It's not about knowing more. Do you know if discipleship was all about the knowledge in your head. You know who would be the greatest disciple that's ever lived? Satan. Satan knows more about the Bible than you and I will ever know. You read about it, he lived it. You read Job, guess who was there? Satan. You read about Jesus being tempted, guess who was there? Satan. Discipleship is not about knowledge. You know what it is? It's about applying the knowledge to then walking it out in life, becoming more like Jesus every day. This is what I want for me, and I hope it's what you want for you. This church is going to be a disciple-making church. And that's the purpose of our church. We have a very comfortable church. Brisbane is a very comfortable city. This is one of the best, if not best, cities in Australia to live in. It's absolutely unbelievable. Seth just moved up from Melbourne. He escaped communist Victoria. (laughs) He escaped behind the red curtain down there and came up. And uh, and I was just talking with Seth about how great, you know, Brisbane is. It's so much better than Melbourne. So we're so comfortable. Like our church is so, it's so comfortable. Brisbane is so comfortable comfortable and we can so easily fall into this trap. I said it to our leaders on Saturday. I got to be careful how I say this because people can take this the wrong way. But you know one of the worst things I think happened to the Western church is we stopped getting persecuted. Because without persecution it becomes really easy just to treat church as just something you do on the weekend. Like if you're persecuted for something, it means that you really want to be there. If you're not persecuted, give or take, should we go today or go down the coast? Like in my country, where I live, Christian churches two months ago got bombed in the south by radical uh, terrorists because they're Christian. That's persecution. They show up to church under the threat of death. We show up to church 
or we show up to the coast, <laughs> or we might go into South Bank. Come on, can we be real for a second? Right? I think, I, I think one of the greatest things, per, persecution, man, it makes you, it, it will separate those that really love Jesus and those that are just happy with attending a church. It'll separate the goats from the sheep. That's a biblical reference. Look that up if you don't know what that means. It will, shep, it will separate the goats from the sheep. When things happen in society, things that have gone on in society more and more recently in the last 10 years and moving into a woke agenda and all this stuff, I'm not making this political, but I remember a great statement my brother-in-law said when we were going through all this stuff and, and, and are we going to change constitutions, are we going to do this? My brother-in-law is a great pastor. He said that what will begin to happen is we'll begin to separate Christians who believe the word of God and Christians who just want to go to a club. And we got to be people that don't just turn up to a church. Can I encourage you? Don't just be a church attendee. Be a disciple of Jesus. Be someone that's chasing after Jesus. And if you don't know everything and if you don't understand everything, welcome to the club. No one does. And if, if you get to a moment where you feel like you understand everything about God, then you're not worshiping the one true God. Because if you're able to reduce the creator to something you can fully understand and fully fathom that is not the right god that you're worshiping there will always be an air of mystery to god because he is so much bigger than we can even imagine there's this mystery to who he is and i want to encourage you don't just settle with being someone that attends church be someone that goes jesus i want more of you Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want to be a follower. I want to be someone where I'm so in love with you. People notice, not for my own glory, but people say, ha, ah, they might not be schooled. I don't think they've been to one of them Bible schools, but man, they look like they've been walking with that Jesus. They look like they've been walking with that Jesus. Oh, God, let that be what people say about me. Ah, he might not be very polished. He's got a few rough edges, but mm, it looks like he's walking with that Jesus. That's what I want. I don't want to be some, oh, he looks like he attends that church. Nope. I don't want that. I want to be a Jesus follower, not just a church attender. Don't ever fall into the trap of being a church attender. Follow Jesus. But, but still attend church attend church amen amen Amen. i love god i love his presence come on why don't we stand worship team why don't you come let's just worship for a moment to be a disciple of jesus follow him love him jesus you're wonderful come on just lift your hands to heaven if you can thank you lord if you want to move out of your seat Come down the front. Just move around. I don't care. I just like people moving because it it shifts you out of your comfort zone. There's no reason why I'm just saying just move. Just let's just have a few minutes in the presence of God. Just move out of your comfort zone. God, we thank you. Come on. Lord, we love you. If you speak in a heavenly language, come on. You can begin to pray right now. Worship you, God. Let your presence come and fill this house. Come on, let's sing Christ our King. Christ our King. Be a throne. Be a throne. Be lifted high. Christ our King. Be forever glorified.
Let's sing it again. Come on, I want to lift up Jesus Christ, our King. And if you're here tonight and you're saying, James, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I don't want to fall into a church trap. I don't want to get too comfortable in these nice padded seats. I, I want to step out. I want to be someone that follows him. I want to take responsibility. Maybe you're here and maybe you know you've been drinking milk for a long time. You're like, tonight's the night. I, I need to get onto the solid food. Come on, whatever God has been convicting you about, can you lift your hands to heaven right now? And I just want you to have your own moment with God. Just now, whatever he's convicting you about, begin to lift it up to him. Say, God, would you forgive me? God, would you help me? God, would you put the right people around me? God, would you help me stop blaming others? God, would you help me take responsibility for myself? God, would you let the word begin to open up to me? Revelation from your word. Oh, you're wonderful, Jesus. Wonderful, Jesus. Wonderful Jesus, Ababa Rabba Sititi, Iria Rabba Baba Hadrabu. Oh, would you align us tonight, God? Align us, align us. One, two degrees off, even if it's small, just begin to align us. Align us, align us, align us. Let your presence fall, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Wonderful. Oh, I just see in the spirit, I see this church, our church disciples just beginning to flow in, but more importantly, flow out to this city. Disciples being strengthened and built up, but flowing out to workplaces, flowing out to cities, some even flowing out to nations in Jesus' name. Making disciples, making disciples, making disciples. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Dean and Dee, I was really impacted by a conversation that we had at the beginning. I came inside and I began to worship, and I just felt the Holy Spirit give me a picture about you. And it was a simple one, I, and, I, and I just prayed, God, would you just give me a little bit more? Because I just saw this picture of you walking up to a buffet and eating, just grabbing food on this buffet. And just getting more and just getting more and eating and getting more it's not a very spiritual picture but just getting more getting more and just getting more this buffet buffet and as i was saying i'm like lord what why and i just felt the holy spirit put in my heart this for you and i know we talked and so it's not a word of knowledge but i found him speak to me about our conversation and just say this there is a buffet of god that is a never-ending buffet to feed yourself and, and here and here's the picture that I got as you fed yourself you then turned around and you began to teach other people how to feed themselves from this never-ending buffet and it was like you fed and you didn't get fat you you didn't get full you just kept eating and you kept eating and you kept eating there's a, there's a desire in you to search the scriptures but i want to speak over you tonight there's not a desire just to search there is going to come upon you an ability to teach to teach others and it doesn't mean about getting on some big stage somewhere no it's in the day to day as well you're going to be someone that teaches and even though i felt that for you d you're a part of this as well there's a ministry call on your guy's life that God has his hand on both of you and it's gone like this a little bit but God has his hand on you and I believe that the scriptures you're gonna begin to eat more and that buffet is gonna go more it's gonna go more it's gonna go more come on just lift your hands to heaven right now Jesus I thank you for this couple oh God
The world needs more truth and fresh revelation is coming on you in a way that you have lived the church brat life and God's gonna use that for you to be able to reach others with truth God is lighting something inside of you for truth not not the shallow crap not the uh, everything truth and grace but god is lighting something and i just see this as you're playing the drums and you're a pretty good drummer by the way and i just see this and i know again we talk but i just see this on you is that god is actually going to use your testimony you can say hey i grew up in this i went through this. you know why i can speak with such authority on this because i've lived this I speak from a place of authority because I know it and I defeated the curse of the bratty church kid and so have you so speak the truth don't be ashamed of it God is anointed come on lift your hands to heaven God I pray let an anointing for truth come and fall and not just truth but God let him speak the truth with grace let him speak the truth with love let him speak the truth with an authority that he has lived out Lord Jesus oh let the truth come the world is full of lies the world is full of subjective truth Come on, God is calling you to be someone that draws people back to a moral truth found in the Word of God. It won't be your great opinions that you live by. It will be the Word of the Lord that gives you authority and the Word of the Lord that you will live by. Truth smothered in grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, look at me. Look at me. You're not that church brat kid. You were. Your brother was. Via was. There's a lot of it. I was. Ben was. Amy was. There's a lot of us here. Jake certainly was. No more. You got this. Truth with grace. There's an anointing coming on you. You're, I just see you speaking. I, like, I, I see words coming out literally light shooting into darkness and, and darkness kind of separating with truth that comes out of your mouth. So walk in it. Walk in it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love God. Come on, one more time. Lift your hands. Christ our King. Come on, be enthroned. Be enthroned, be lifted up. Christ You know, I gave a gospel message before. Sin separates us from God. In order to get to him, we need Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, maybe you've never given your life to him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away from God. Offense, hurt, I don't know, but you're here tonight for a reason. 
I want to give you a chance to respond, not to me, not to this church, but to respond to Jesus. Could you just bow your heads, close your eyes? If you're saying, James, that's me, I'm that first person. I've, I've never done this. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person. I did this a long time ago, but I've walked away. I, I need Jesus to come and forgive me. I need an active relationship with Jesus. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand nice and high. I want to pray for you right where you stand. One, two, three, right now, all over this room. Would you say yes to Jesus? If you want to lift your hand, say yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your hand in the back. Anybody else that would say yes? Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Thank you for your hand here. Hey, if you lifted your hand, come on. Can you put your hand on your heart right now? We're going to pray a prayer together. I want you to repeat these words with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus. We're all going to pray it. Say, dear Lord Jesus, Jesus. come to you right now. Come to you right now. And I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross. But you defeated the power of sin. And you rose from the grave. So right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for those that responded? If you lifted your hand, one of our teams is going to come and say hi to you and explain the decision you made. You know, the journey of being a Christian is not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done in family. I want to encourage you as a church. The purpose of our church is not to make you feel comfortable. I promise you, you will feel a little bit comfortable because we have nice seats. But the purpose of our church is to worship God. And once we have the revelation of what it means to worship God, then we have to take how good he is in our life and we got to share it. And we got to go out, we got to make disciples, train them, and then we got to release them.